Good morning, church family. Wish I could be in person with you. Unfortunately, we've uh, had the bug uh, going through our home, and so I have been home the last few days, and so I am pre-recording this to share with you. But I want to, again, just let you know that I miss being with you in person. Look forward to uh, next week when I'll be able to, uh, to be back with you. Probably each and every one of us would admit that this has been quite a week. A week that probably many of us never thought we'd, we'd see in our lifetime. Things that have happened, things that have occurred. And if there was ever a time that we needed a reminder that God is still at work, it might be now. Saw and read a quote from pastor and author A.W. Tozer that went something like this. While it looks like everything is out of control, behind the scenes, there is a God that has not surrendered authority. And that's the hope that we need to hang on to today. And my prayer today is that God will give us a little bit of that hope. Reminding us that he is the potter and that we are the clay, that he is molding and shaping us, shaping his followers for his kingdom purposes. So I want to begin with a, just a brief story. really has nothing at all to do with the message, but hopefully it'll at least give you uh, maybe a little smile. Johnson, Tennessee, a police officer and his partner pulled over an unlicensed motorist. And they asked the man to follow them to the police station, but, but while on their way to the station, they spotted a North Carolina vehicle whose driver matched the description of a very dangerous criminal. So the officers took off on a high-speed chase for some 20 miles, often going over 110 miles per hour. They finally stopped and arrested that North Carolina criminal. And as they were loading the felon into the squad car, the unlicensed motorist drove up, white as a sheet, shaking, and said, if you all will just tell me how to get to the station, I'll just meet you there. He said, I'm having a heck of a time keeping up with you. So this morning, we want to dive back into Jeremiah. We're going to be in chapters 18 through 20 this morning. We're in a series, or a week number seven of our series. And as we have identified over our entire study of Jeremiah's book, is the main goal of Jeremiah's messages, the main goal of the entire book actually, is for Jeremiah to preach that the nation of Judah would repent, that they would return to the loving embrace of the living God. And if they chose not to, Jeremiah continued to provide warnings that judgment was coming. And so for over 40 years, Jeremiah preached that message of warning, of repentance, of return to God's embrace, and unfortunately, that message continued to fall on deaf ears. The warnings were ignored, and ultimately, as you know from history already, the nation of Judah ended up enduring 70 years of captivity at the hands of the nation of Babylon. But one of the other things that we've talked about is the fact that Jeremiah was often very creative in some of his messages and how he chose to communicate this idea of repentance and how he chose to communicate the warnings that God had given to him. And so that's going to be the same this morning in chapters 18 through 20 that God has a couple of very creative messages that he wants Jeremiah to communicate to the nation of Judah. And these two lessons would occur at the potter's house. And so I want to begin by reading Jeremiah 18. We're going to start with verses 1 through 6, just to get the context this morning. 
This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was making, the pot he was shaping from the clay, was marred in his hand. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do the same thing with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And so in verse 2, we read the fact that God had a specific message for Jeremiah that would be learned at the potter's house. So he needed to go down and spend some time watching the potter mold and shape the clay. Now, what I'm holding obviously is not clay, but it's the nearest thing that, uh, that we had in our house, glorified Play-Doh, okay? But the message that Jeremiah would see and learn and then be able to communicate started with understanding that we, in a sense, are like clay. And so the first part of our message this morning is this. The potter shapes and molds us into a vessel fit for his purposes. He shapes and molds us into a vessel fit for his purposes. Now, it would be easy, and, and often is easy, to believe that we somehow determine our own lives, our own course of action. But I want you to think just a little bit deeper this morning. Because first off, you had no control over what country you were born into. You had no control over what time frame you were born into. You had no control over the color of your eyes. You had no control over the color of your skin, your IQ, the opportunities that, that you've had in life. All of those things were actually provided by God. And so the potter begins with a lump of clay. It's shapeless. It has no purpose, no beauty. I mean, when that, when that clay is actually dug out of the ground, it has no value. And, and to the naked eye, to most of us, it would probably just look like mud. But the potter takes that lump of clay and he puts it on his wheel to begin molding and shaping us into something useful. Now, what you're seeing up on the screen is a picture of an old pottery wheel. And the potter puts the lump of clay on that pottery wheel. And so we're going to spend just a little time with this picture uh, right there in front of us. I by no means am a pottery expert. But my sister-in-law does quite a bit of pottery. And she actually has made us a number of items that we have used and saved over the years. So let's look at just a couple of the things that, uh, that we've got. Um, we have this, this gravy bowl that uh, my sister-in-law made for us. And we don't use it often. Lee, actually, when I got it out to, uh, to use as a displays, I didn't even realize we still had that. Um, here's a couple bowls that were made that we do use on occasion. And uh, again, things that my sister-in-law has made for us that she formed on the pottery wheel and then fired in a kiln that uh, she and my brother have made. Number of years ago, we got a plate set that, uh, and, and a bowl set that we used uh, for a long time. Um, some of those plates and bowls have now gotten broken or chipped, and so we don't use them uh, nearly as much, but we still have, uh, have saved a number of those and, uh, and hang on to, uh, to those. And then uh, another smaller bowl that goes along with that set as well. 
But anyway, getting back to the pottery wheel for just a second, it consists of two wheels, as you can see on the picture. The wheel, the larger one on the bottom, at, that is connected then to a much smaller wheel at the very top. The large wheel on the bottom is turned by the potter's feet, and then that spins the top wheel where the potter then begins to mold and to shape that lump of clay into whatever he has determined that clay will be formed or molded or shaped into. Now, a couple things that we need to draw uh, some conclusions about with this uh, whole idea of the potter molding and shaping us into a vessel fit for his purposes. And the first thing is this, we need to make sure and realize that we have not ended up on the potter's wheel by mistake. There is a purpose and a motive behind everything that the potter does. He has something in mind the minute he begins to mold and to shape that lump of clay. I mean, in a sense, we are like that blob of clay. And it's not that we're so valuable. That clay isn't what's so valuable. But what matters is the hands that you are in. What matters is that the potter actually holds you in his hands and begins to mold and shape you into something of value and purpose. Let me give you a couple other examples. An NBA, an official NBA basketball costs about $170. Now, if you were to place that ball in my hands, okay, I mean, I can kind of dribble a little bit and I can make on occasion a couple baskets here or there. But if you were to place that ball into the hands of Steph Curry, it becomes a whole lot more valuable than it does when it's placed in my hands. In the hands of Steph Curry, that means it's $40 million a year in value. Or how about a Major League Baseball? Costs approximately $6 for a Major League Baseball. In my hands, worth nothing. I mean, honestly, I would probably be lucky from the pitcher's mound to get it close to uh, the catcher behind the plate. And we won't even bother talking about hitting at this point. But that same $6 ball placed into the hands of Major League Baseball player Mike Trout, it becomes a whole lot more valuable. In fact, $36 million a year valuable. All right, and we could go on. How about tennis balls? You could stop in at Walmart and you can get a can of three tennis balls for probably under $3. Again, in my hands, worth literally nothing. But placed into the hands of Roger Federer or hit by the racket of Roger Federer, it becomes $106.3 million from 2020. That's how much he earned as a tennis player. Golf ball, two to three dollars. But again, placed into the hands of Tiger Woods, worth some 62.3 million dollars in 2020. So again, the lump of clay is not what's valuable, but in whose hands you are placed. Our value comes in the fact that God is the potter. He's the one who's molding and shaping us. In Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, we read these verses, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his son. Did you catch that? Those that are on God's wheel, his pottery wheel, he is molding and shaping them to be conformed into the likeness of his son. Nothing he does 
is by mistake. So, uh, there's a second picture that you're seeing up on your screen right now. And as that pottery wheel is turned, the potter begins to form that clay by applying some friction or a little pressure in order to mold and shape that clay into something usable. God does the same in our lives. Often applying a little bit of friction, maybe some pressure, maybe some trouble, maybe some trials, maybe some difficulties to mold and shape us into something usable for his kingdom purposes. Eventually, that potter then cuts the excess away, and then that pot, that whatever is molded, whatever is shaped, whatever is formed from that, from that clay, then is put into a kiln in order to fire and harden and purify what the potter made. Now, I mentioned earlier that my sister-in-law made a number of these different items for us. And they actually built, my brother and my sister-in-law built a huge outdoor kiln in order to fire some of these uh, pottery items that she has made, the things that she's created out of clay. And I remember my brother telling me that the first time they fired that kiln up, they used over a face cord of wood in order to get it hot enough to actually fire the items that that she created. And my brother said that they had like 20 foot flames shooting up out of the top of that chimney for the kiln. And he said it was just absolutely crazy. Now I want you to look back into Jeremiah chapter 18. I want you to look at verse four because there's a specific message that, that God wanted to communicate to Jeremiah about the nation of Judah. He said, but the pot he was shaping at the wheel, or from the clay, was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. And so God had a specific message that he wanted Jeremiah to communicate to the Jews, to the nation of Judah, that they had been on his pottery wheel. And he had been forming them and molding them and shaping them, but they had not responded well. They, in a sense, as verse 4 tells us, had become marred in his hand, so the potter had to begin again with a new, uh, with, with creating a new usable vessel. And so we know the story up to this point, everything that we've learned from Jeremiah about the nation of Judah to that point, they had embraced idolatry and very openly. And that was how they became marred in the hands of the potter. And so it resulted in God, in a sense, having to start over and to shape them into something new. Now, one of the things, please notice, and please remember, even for your own life, the potter didn't completely discard the clay. He didn't cast the clay aside and said, you're no longer usable, I can't uh, use you anymore. Instead, he made the clay into a new vessel. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, and I know I say that a lot in different things that uh, different passages that occasionally I'll quote. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, which says this, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That God began the work. He's the potter. He was molding and shaping. And he began that good work, and he's going to complete it. He'll never throw it away. He'll never discard your life even though you might experience some difficulties, even though God might have to begin anew, he'll never completely discard you. He'll never throw in the towel on us. Instead, he continues to work on us, seeking to mold and shape us to look 
more like Jesus. And just like that potter applies more friction or pressure to mold and shape that clay into something usable, God does the same in our lives. And so this morning, I, one of the questions that I want you to consider is, are you cooperating with the potter? Or are you resisting his work? And in a sense, becoming marred in the hands of the potter. God's always working for the good of those who love him and have been called according to God's purposes. Now, sometimes when we face that friction, when we feel that pressure, sometimes it's uncomfortable. A lot of times it's uncomfortable. And, and sometimes we even complain about the difficulties we're experiencing. And, and much like maybe we're, we're frustrated with some of the difficulties we're experiencing in our country even right now, and we complain. Now, notice a couple things, because when we get to chapter 20, you'll actually hear that same thing from Jeremiah, because as faithful as Jeremiah was in continuing to communicate this message, he kind of threw up his hands and said, God, what I'm experiencing is not right. It's not fair. I've been obedient to you. God, it's, it's painful. He actually endures some physical pain, as we'll see when we get into chapter 20 this morning. But God had a plan. Just as he has a plan in your life, and in my life, and in the life of those who follow Jesus here within this country. So that's the first lesson in the potter's house. But God also had another lesson for Jeremiah and the nation of Judah. And it as well came from the potter's house. So let's jump ahead to chapter 19. Again, just a reminder, we're taking you know, broad uh, sections of scripture. We're just hitting some high points. And so here's a second lesson from the potter's house. Verse, verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Go and buy a clay jar from a potter. Take along some of the elders of the people and of the people and of the priests and go out to the valley of Ben Hinnom near the entrance of the potsherd gate. There proclaim the words I tell you and say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and people of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Listen, I am going to bring a disaster on this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. For they have forsaken me and made this a place of foreign gods. So let me stop right there. So God now had a second lesson for Jeremiah. This one wasn't just to observe the potter, but instead to go and to actually purchase something that the potter had made there out of clay something that had been placed in the fire and hardened okay and purified and so that's exactly what jeremiah did and then he was told to bring along some of the elders of the nation of judah when you buy that pot and then go and preach this message near the pots heard gates or the, a place um, known as the valley of Ben Hinnom, or also known as Topheth. And so that's exactly what Jeremiah does. So there's a second lesson that we're going to see here that God wanted to communicate to the nation of Judah, and that is because eventually God asked Jeremiah to break that plate or that jar that he purchased. And so the broken jar was a visual message that God was going to discipline the nation of Judah. The broken plate was a visual message that God was going to discipline the nation of Judah. So Jeremiah makes a second visit to the potter's house, purchases the plate, and as he begins the lesson with the elders near a place called Topheth, or the, the valley of Ben-Hinnom, which, which really was no more than the local garbage dump, 
Jeremiah then takes that jar or that plate that he'd purchased and shatters it all over the ground. Now, look at verse 10 of chapter 19. And we'll pick it up. It says, Then break the jar while those who go with you are watching. And say to them, This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. They will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. This is what I'll do to this place and to those who live here, declares the Lord. I will make this city like Topheth. The house, which again, remember, Topheth was the garbage dump. God says, I'm going to make Judah like the garbage dump. The houses in Jerusalem and those of the kings of Judah will be defiled like this place. Topheth and all the houses where they burned incense on the roofs to all the starry hosts and poured out drink offerings to other gods. And so in the midst of that message to the elders, Jeremiah took that, that pot that he purchased from the potter's house and he shattered it. Broke it to pieces as a visual, as a reminder that this is the discipline that God will bring on the nation of Judah because of your idolatry, because you refuse to return, because you refuse to repent. God has already realized that your hearts are hardened and any chance for repentance has ended because your minds are made up. This is what will happen. And so, the nation of Babylon will be the ones to bring this destruction to your city. You know, sometimes when we experience discipline, we think God's got it out for us. And we accuse Him of not loving us. But I want you to keep your finger there in Jeremiah, and I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews this morning. The book of Hebrews, just a couple verses that I want to draw our attention to, because God does have a purpose for the discipline that he brings into our lives. Hebrews chapter 12, and I want you to look at verse 5, the end of verse 5. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not make light when, when God may have to break your plate. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Jump ahead to verse 10. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And so the writer of Hebrews begins this little passage about discipline with these words, do not lose heart when you're disciplined. Now, I don't know about you, but I know in my own life, I can very easily lose heart when I'm experiencing discipline. And so that idea of don't lose heart, it's often easier said than done because a lot of times we can cop an attitude. We can throw up our hands. We can complain. We can think, what's the point? God's got it out for me. And maybe with some of the difficulties you're experiencing in your life, maybe you're feeling that even right now. But I want to challenge you. Believe and trust the truth from God's word. Don't lose heart. Because God's discipline, as it says there in verse 6, comes from a heart of love. Verse 10 tells us that he disciplines us for our good, that we might share in his holiness. That there's a purpose behind it. And just as the potter applies friction and pressure to make us into a usable vessel for him, 
Sometimes that comes in the form of discipline. God's purpose is that we should share in his holiness, that we would become like him. Finally, the writer of Hebrews says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. And so whether that discipline comes from God, whether that discipline comes from a parent, whether that discipline comes from a fellow believer who loves us enough to come alongside and correct us, who is concerned about our growth and our maturity, there is a purpose. We might not like it initially, but it produces a harvest of righteousness that God intends for our growth. You know, years ago, after my freshman year of college, my uh, youth pastor, youth leader, just a volunteer, was someone who offered a bit of correction in my life. You see, he kind of heard through the grapevine, gotten wind of the fact that I'd lived a, a little bit of a rebellious a lifestyle that freshman year at college, 500 miles from home, out from under mom and dad's watchful eye. And yet, my youth leader had heard, and he loved me enough to confront me. Now, guess what happened? Initially, I didn't receive it well. Okay? And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews tells us in verse, verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. It wasn't pleasant for me to hear that from my youth leader. And I didn't receive it well, and I got defensive, and I got angry, and, and I even avoided him for a while. But in time, I realized he did it because he loved me and cared for me. And his actions eventually produced a harvest of righteousness in my life. And I would confess to you today that one of the reasons I'm actually in ministry today is because of the love and correction that that youth leader offered to me as a young freshman college student. It's one of the reasons I'm in ministry today. God was bringing discipline to the nation of Judah. The smash clay pot the smashed plate was that second lesson from the potter's house. And Jeremiah didn't communicate that lesson just once, but actually twice. Once there by the potter gate in, in, uh, near Topheth. But then if you look at verse 14 of Jeremiah 19, it says this, Jeremiah then returned from Topheth where the Lord sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's temple and said to the people, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Listen, I am going to bring on this city and the villages around it every disaster I pronounced against them because they were stiff-necked and would not listen to my words. And so now Jeremiah preaches that same message. The broken pot, the broken plate, he preaches it a second time, but this time to a much broader audience in the temple courts. Which leads to, ultimately, a third lesson that I want us to understand this morning, and that is this. The potter's house lessons stepped on some toes and resulted in some painful consequences for Jeremiah. Because the second time Jeremiah preached this message... He stepped on some toes. And at least one individual, a guy by the name of Pasher, wasn't real happy about what Jeremiah said. Look at chapter 20. When the priest, Pasher, son of Immer, the chief officer in the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, he had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin, at the Lord's temple. So we're introduced to this guy, Pasher, who apparently was kind of the chief security officer at the temple. And the sermon Jeremiah preached didn't sit well with him, offended him, 
And so he had Jeremiah arrested, had Jeremiah beaten, and then he had Jeremiah thrown in the stocks. And those stocks were in a very public place. So not only was Jeremiah suffering from some physical, physical pain, but also experiencing some shame as he was there in the stocks in front of the eyes of all those who visited the temple courts that day. It was probably one more reason why Jeremiah probably would have preferred to be a priest instead of the prophet. But again, through everything that we've learned to this point, and through everything that we see, even in the midst of some of Jeremiah's complaints, he faithfully carried out his role as a prophet. Even when he experienced persecution, and now that persecution, which previously had been just verbal, now has actually become physical persecution. Look what happens. Verse 3, chapter 20. The next day, when Pasha released him from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord's name for you is not Pasha, but Magor Misabib. For this is what the Lord says, I will make you a terror to yourself and all of your friends with your own eyes. You will see them fall by the sword of their enemies, and I will hand all Judah over to the king of Babylon, who will carry them away to Babylon or put them to the sword. I will hand over to their enemies all the wealth of this city, all of its products, all of its value, valuables, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah. They will take it away as plunder and carry it off to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all those who live in your house will go into exile to Babylon. There you will die and be buried, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. And so Jeremiah experienced some physical pain. Arrested, beaten, thrown in the stocks. He was shamed by being placed there overnight in view of all those who visited the temple courts. And yet the next day when he was released, he continued to be faithful to his calling. He didn't back down. He continued the same bold message that he'd been communicating. And now he gives a few more specific details. He tells Pasher, you're going to be known as Magor Misabib, which means terror on every side. That's what God would be bringing. Terror on every side. In verse 4, Jeremiah now identifies that it's the nation of Babylon that would do the invading. Up till this point, we've just heard that there would be an invasion that would come from the north. But now here in chapter 20, Jeremiah identifies that the nation that's doing the invading is Babylon. They would be the ones that would shatter that clay pot. They would be the invading kingdom. And we also learn that because of Pasher's actions, because of what he did to Jeremiah, both he and his entire family would be taken into exile into Babylon where they would die. Man, I don't know about you, but Jeremiah sure had courage in my eyes. He knew God's call in his life and he faithfully obeyed, refusing to back down no matter the opposition that he faced. But guess what? We also see that Jeremiah was human. And we once again see him crying out to God at the injustice that he'd suffered and experienced. Look at verse 7. Oh Lord, you deceived me, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. Man, I love Jeremiah's honesty. Like, God, I am, I am faithful to you, but it sure feels like you've deceived me. Now, is that the truth? No, not at all. I mean, if you reflect all the way back to Jeremiah chapter 1 on God's initial call to Jeremiah, he told him, 
in uh, Jeremiah 1, 17 to 19. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Don't be terrified by them. And then he goes on to say, they will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. So God reminded Jeremiah, you know what? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to hear your complaints, but I have not deceived you. And in fact, if you ref reflect or recall when I actually called you into this position as a prophet, I told you, you would experience this, that you're going to find people fighting against you. You're going to experience persecution. You're going to experience difficulty. But also remember, that's part of the molding and shaping process for your own life. But remember, I also will rescue you, declares the Lord. And deep down, I believe Jeremiah knew that was the truth. Deep down, Jeremiah knew that, that even if he tried to be quiet, there was no way he could. Look at what he says in verse 9. But if I say, I will not mention him, I'm not going to talk about God. I'm not going to speak anymore in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones and I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. You maybe have heard that verse previously, but maybe not understood the context in which Jeremiah spoke those words. That it's in the midst of a complaint to God. It's not fair. But even if I tried not to continue to be faithful to what you called me to, I can't hold it in. You've so changed my life. You've so transformed me that I can't hold in the words that you've given me to speak to the nation of Judah. He was continuing to become what God wanted him to be. God was molding and shaping Jeremiah into a usable vessel just as he was beginning to remold and reshape the nation of Judah into a usable vessel. And this morning you can be assured of the same truth. That God is always working on you as well. And there may be some friction. There may be some pressure. There may be some difficulties. But know that it's coming from the hands of a loving potter who has a purpose for everything that he brings into your life. You're on his wheel. And the things that you're experiencing are because he desires to bring them into your life. I want to close with just a couple, couple thoughts from uh, three verses that Paul wrote in, to the, uh, the church of Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 16 through 18 says this. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Those aren't always the easiest verses to live by. Paul says, first off, be joyful always. And I think one of the things we need to remember is that joy is not equivalent to happiness. Okay? Joy isn't based on the circumstances that are swirling around us. Joy is dependent upon Jesus. And just as God reminded Jeremiah that he would always be with him, you as well can be assured that God will never leave you and never forsake you. He will be with you to the very end of the age. So you can have joy because God is the potter and we are on his wheel. But then Paul goes on to say, pray continually. You know, we've got this prayer and praise event tonight in partnership with De Caloris Ministries, five o'clock right here in the sanctuary. You know, we need to be a people of prayer. And I've even heard some of you actually say, we need to do more in this particular area. 
which I would completely agree with, which is why when we have an event like this, you all need to be here. You need to be a part of these prayer events. Because we need it individually, we need it as a church, we need it as a community, we need it as a country. We need it as Christ's followers. Pray continually. And then finally, Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. Notice Paul doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances, but in all circumstances so even when you're maybe being molded and shaped and it's and the friction is painful the pressure is painful even when that plate might get broken if you will realize that you can still give thanks because God is with you Jeremiah could give thanks in all circumstances because God was with him all right, let me uh, just quick give you the assignment for next week. Jeremiah chapters 20, excuse me, 21, 22, and 23 is your reading assignment for next week. So I invite you to participate with us. And again, uh, on the back of your outline, there are some questions that relate to that. First two questions typically stay the same. Is there a, a verse that, or verses that God used to encourage, correct, or convict you? Uh, and do you see any similarities to what Judah was experiencing and what you may be experiencing as an individual or we might be ex ex excuse me, experiencing as a country? And then there's a couple specific questions related to these three chapters, 21, 22, and 23. And I want you to spend some time maybe reflecting on some spiritual high points in your life and what actually factored into those being spiritual high points and then reflect on some of the spiritual low points in your life and what factors may have contributed to those being spiritual low points so again I trust that you continue to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus even in the midst of trials even in the midst of difficulties because we are on that potter's wheel, and he is molding and shaping us into a vessel fit for his purposes. Pray with me. Father God, we love you, and I am grateful, again, even for the use of technology that uh, uh, in the midst of uh, being under the weather, still being able to uh, communicate the, uh, the message that you uh, have given to me to share from Jeremiah 18 through 20. God, I thank you for those that uh, tune in uh, via Facebook, YouTube, and, uh, and, and are following along in our series. God, for those who have been worshiping with us uh, in the building, God, grateful for them as well. And Father, we just continue to pray for your hand of direction upon uh, this country, Father God. And uh, we desperately need you and Lord, I pray that we would be reminded of the fact that uh, our hope is not found in politics. Our hope is not found in government. Our hope is found in you. And so remind us uh, again, Lord, of the fact that you are a loving potter. And we are on your wheel. And you are shaping us and molding us. And, and you haven't discarded us. So we thank you for that. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.